So today, I, for, I apologize for those of you who are not hematologists or immunologists. I will try to be as simple as possible and try to somehow outline what we are doing in the lab, uh, mostly focusing on some unpublished work. Uh, I will give some introduction just for the audience. Um, and I apologize if some of the people in the audience will find it boring, but you know, I thought it was kind of a mix bag of, of brilliant scientists here. So the work will be mainly dealing with, um, with basically studying one molecule that is expressed on the surface of normal B cells and is shared with tumoral B cells, that is the immunoglobulin receptor. It's also called B cell receptor. It's actually the membrane bound form of an immunoglobulin, which is the factor arm of the adaptive immune system. Um, so again, the B cell receptor is you know, part of you know, a complex series of receptors or surface receptor expressed on the, on the life of a lymphocyte, but differently from many other, this, this receptor is really defining life and death of a lymphocyte. A B cell exists because of the ability to produce antibodies, to recognize antigens as a result of the recognition of them through the B cell receptor. So it is maybe not far fetched to think that this receptor indeed plays all the major functions that define the fate of a lymphocyte. And there has been a fundamental, very simple genetic experiment performed in the Rayeski lab at the end of uh, the last century where they conditionally knocked out the B cell receptor in a resting lymphocyte. So a cell that does not recognize any antigen through, through the B cell receptor, just to actually understand what this receptor does in resting condition, whether it would transmit any signal and what would be actually the outcome of this inactivation. And the result was striking, namely that the absence of the receptor in a resting cell that is actually sitting in our lymph nodes leads to a very rapid disappearance of the cell. And this brought to the concept that there is indeed some sort of ongoing tonic signal that actually is provided by the B cell receptor that tells the lymphocyte, I do still need to exist. I need to exist because I need to recognize an antigen as a result of basically the binding through the B cell receptor. So this very complex intersection of different signaling pathways is actually the final uh, outcome of signals that are in part deriving from the interaction with the microenvironment, but in part are actually sustaining the persistence of these cells in our lymphoid organ. So a lymphocyte, just to give you an idea, if it doesn't recognize an antigen, will remain in our system around between six and, and eight weeks. So differently from T cells, which are generated early in our life and persist for the rest of our life. Lymphocytes are constantly replenished. And this is also very relevant in the context of how everybody of us interacts with the external world and is more or less resistant or susceptible to infectious agents because everything comes with the ability of our B cells to recognize an antigen through the B cell receptor. And every B cell receptor has a unique specificity that is actually imprinted genetically from a process called VDJ recombination. So imagine that in our blood, we have around 10 to the 11, 12 different possible complex complexity in visa receptor specificity. And at every time point of our life, this receptor repertoire is changing because lymphocytes die, new lymphocytes come with a different receptor specificity. So the chance you will be able to respond to influenza virus in one specific moment may not be exactly the same in a different moment where the repertoire is constantly dynamically defined. Okay, so um, the receptor is, is important at different stages of the lymphocyte life. So we start with early progenitors where you have somatic recombination events which allow uh, the B cells to assemble this complex repertoire. So this is a recombination event whereby blocks of DNA are brought together by a process called VDJ recombination. And this process is totally stochastic. Um, so you generate variable regions that are the ones responsible for the binding to the antigen that are first related to the immunoglobulin heavy chain. So every antibody has two chains, a heavy and a light chain. So you go through first a heavy chain expression and then you rearrange the light chain variable region and when the heavy chain and light chain are being produced inside the cell if they're able to pair which is another important checkpoint moment in the life of a lymphocyte the receptor will be brought on the surface and will be subjected to a first important selection namely every lymphocyte that in the bone marrow where the B cells are generated recognize self-antigens these B cells will be either depleted clonally deleted 
or actually they will undergo a process called receptor revision or receptor editing, where the cell will try to arrange a second immunoglobulin light chain with the idea to actually change the receptor specificity. So this is a very important moment in B cell tolerance. It's not as strict as T cell tolerance. So we have a number of autoreactive B cells leaving the bone marrow um, and possibly recognizing self-antigen. But as a matter of fact, there's a very important checkpoint here. Once this checkpoint is fulfilled, the B cells leave the bone marrow and through the blood migrate to the lymphoid organs where they complete their differentiation into three major subsets that are defined here as follicular, marginal zone B1. They have different functions. They are recruited in different types of immune responses. But what I want to stress here is basically the moment where some B cells will recognize as a result of the recognition of antigen to the B cell receptor, will get recruited with T cell help into these structures called the germinal centers. These are really unique structures. They are transient in, in life. They are not predefined in, in the lymph node or in the spleen where the immune responses take place. They nucleate really around a single lymphocyte that actually starts clonally expanding as a result of the recognition of antigen through the B cell receptor. So it's, it's basically a, a rapidly proliferating B cell that actually undergoes also important changes in its DNA sequence because you basically have a situation where the immunoglobulin variable region gene that drives that recruitment is bombarded by DNA mutation that are introduced by an enzyme called activation-induced cytidine deaminase. So this is an enzyme that deaminates cytidines, rendering them uracils, which are then recognized by, recognized by a complex DNA repair mechanism that leads the recruitment locally of error-prone polymerases that will actually introduce mutation in the variable region gene. So as a result of this, a single founder will have daughter cells which will actually slightly be different one from the other in terms of their antigen binding ability. So you have a real true Darwinian moment where there, there is basically expansion and then selection of the, of the B cells based on the ability to bind the antigen to the B cell receptor. So we have a phase of proliferation. Cells will then migrate to a different region of the germinal center where they recognize antigen by presented by follicular dendritic cells, and with the help of T cells, only very few will win the selection. The, the vast majority of a germinal center reaction is a waste of the immune system. The cells die, um, and, 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 and the only cells that you generate are high affinity B cells that are actually then classified as memory cells, and these are cells that are still expressing the immunoglobulin on the surface, or they actually become effector cells, namely they start becoming really secreting cells, so they they expand the endoplasmic reticulum, they become really a factor of antibodies, and this represents a factor arm. So these are the antibodies that will flow in your blood and recognize viruses and pathogens, and through the formation of immune complexes, will then actually facilitate the clearance of the pathogen through macrophages and other cell types. So um, that's what basically the receptor does, and it does important things at different moments of, 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 the, of the development of the cell. Now, all this is relevant because Actually, tumors arising from um, B cells are actually developmental mistakes of a normal process that leads B cells to generate this memory and um, plasma cells. So differently from probably many cancer cells, many solid cancers, where the acquisition of a transformed phenotype is the result of genetic alterations that actually change uh, specific features in the property of the cell, what the lymphoma is, which is just a type of B cell, is a, a cell arrested in a specific stage of its development and still retains most of the function of that cell. And one of it is to retain on the surface of the cell the immunoglobulin. So this is just a cartoon indicating different type of tumors. Every tumor has a, you know, a certain type of genetic alterations. Follicular lymphoma has a translocation leading BCL2 to be expressed from immunoglobulin regulatory sequence. The same is true for Burkitt lymphoma. And there are many other mutations that actually allow the cell to survive forever and to actually get protected from apoptosis. So you would imagine that with mutations that are as aggressive as, you know, overexpression of an anti-apoptotic or overexpression of a very potent oncogen as MYC, the cell would somehow not necessarily require any further the expression of the immunoglobulin. This cell has been lost from the immune system. It will not contribute anymore to an immune reaction. So you would also imagine that maybe the receptor plays no role anymore in these tumors. As a matter of fact, over 30 years 
of work, and Dimitri has been actually also significantly contributing to the field, there is basically now, if, a, a, there has been a growing number of evidence pointing out that the receptor still retains important function in supporting the survival of the tumor cells. And the biology of the receptor in different tumor types may change. Um, a formal proof for that uh, has only been given very recently, however. So how do receptors, how could receptors eventually contribute to malignant transformation or persistence of the tumor? So it is now clear that some of these antibodies produced by tumor cells indeed do recognize pathogens. So there are a number of clear examples. For example, lymphomas that are occurring in the stomach as a result of helicobacter pylori infection can be cured by antibody treatment. So this is basically eliminating the source of the simulation that actually can induce regression of a tumor. And the same is true for hepatitis C virus infections where lymphomas that are commonly associated to them or can occur together with this disease are usually actually the result of chronic stimulation of the B cells with viral antigens. But you also have other possibilities. There are a number of other, you know, in the meantime reported agents that could trigger chronic um, stimulation of the B cell receptor and by then eventually stimulating signaling pathways that favor proliferation, survival, or contribute to the pro-proliferative and pro-survival activity of oncogenes that are anyway selected by the tumor cells. Um, and, and the receptor signals in tumors in very different way, depending on the type of tumors. So, so it's not that we have, I showed you at the beginning, these very complex networks of signaling pathways. They are not all recruited at the same, to the same extent in different tumors. You have in some, for example, a very strong recruitment of the NF-kappa-B signaling pathways. In other tumors, the PA3 kinase pathway plays an important role. In, lymph in, in CLN, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you have the, the MAP kinase pathway contributing together with the NF-kappa-B and the PA3 kinase pathway. So tumors have hijacked also different types of signaling pathways, depending also on the nature of the genetic lesions that are actually selected in the tumor. So one of the first evidence that pointed out that tumors were still important, the, the B cell receptor was still crucial for the persistence of the tumor cells came from, you know, in vitro experiment that the lab of Louis Stout developed or produced over 20 years ago, uh, where he knocked down uh, components of the B cell receptor. The B cell receptor is composed of the heavy and the light chain and two signaling molecules called CD79 A and B. And any of these four molecules is crucial for the function of the BCR. So what, what the lab did at the time was to actually infect them with short terpene and viruses expressing short terpene RNAs. This is a number of different aggressive B cell Burkitt lymphoma lines and showing actually following the fate of the cells over time. So there were clear evidence also that some of these lines were resistant to the interference with CD79 expression. And I don't have the time here to show you, but these were data where they could of course show that the B cell receptor altogether was downregulated from the surface of the B cell. So um, these experiments led actually the pharma to jump on this signaling pathway and from the very beginning think about developing drugs that would inhibit the pathway with the idea that this could be one potential new mechanism of treatment of B-cell lymphomas that by that time was mainly a, a treatment that was based on combination of chemotherapy agents and, uh, and antibodies that came later. Um, so um, the first and most relevant uh, targets that were identified were kinases that were signaling very proximately downstream of the B cell receptor. And the, the, historically, the first one that was identified was, in, was inhibitors of the bruton tyrosine kinase. And again, there was really, just to give you also some historical perspective, there was no reason why to choose BTK rather than other kinase. I mean, what was known is that there is an immunodeficiency that is basically very common in humans that is caused by um, a mutation in BTK. So the idea was if BTK knockout don't generate B cells, this kinase must be very relevant for B cells. So it must be also very relevant for cancer cells without even knowing the complexity of the signaling pathways that are downstream. It turned out that actually this was a, a very effective choice. It was totally serendipitous to choose BTK rather than you know, another kinase. Um, the introduction of inhibitors of PDK in the clinics have made a major impact on the treatment of a number of, 
of, of B cell lymphomas, uh, B cell malignancies, mainly chronic lymphocytic leukemia, now mantle cell lymphoma, and, 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 and a rare disease called Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. And there are discussions of introducing inhibitors of the B cell receptor also in other type of, of B cell malignancies. Um, now, as in any treatment, uh, you will have the corresponding resistance jumping up as fast as you start treating the patients. Um, and this is no surprise that also with BDK inhibitors, you started having a number of patients responding to the therapy, but then eventually relapsing to the disease. And it was interesting then, you know, to observe that in different tumors, and this is one important concept that goes back to how the different signaling pathways are being used in different tumors, you can appreciate that some of these mutations that have been identified as potential causes of resistance all genes that are usually associated or downstream of the BTK in the BSA receptor signaling pathway, the mutations are not the same in two different tumors. So different tumors use different mechanisms to resist to inhibition of BTK. But the most important and striking thing for me at least was when basically they started outlining the frequency of genetic, of the frequency of these mutations in the patients that had the tumors. So you would imagine that if you give a drug against a kinase, you select the resistance. The resistance is very often associated with a point mutation preventing the binding of the drug to the kinase. Um, you would imagine that that clone would expand in the relapsed uh, patient and all the cells would have the same mutation. But as a matter of fact, the frequency of mutant alleles in this patient is very, very low, pointing out that there is indeed some resistance in post by the acquisition, actually they are not acquisition, they are pre-existing mutations before the beginning of the treatment. But basically the majority of the resistance is possibly provided by mechanisms that we still don't understand completely. I mean, there is now a number of you know, uh, groups and, um, and, and data pointing out that the microenvironment is potentially bypassing the signal provided by the B cell receptor in many different ways. So we will have to be actually more and more, you know, interested in studying bypass mechanisms that are not necessarily only genetic. Okay, so um, now starts my provocative part. So we discuss about resistance to the B cell receptor, but as a matter of fact, um, these tumors still, in most of the cases, when they resist to inhibitors, they retain the B cell receptor. But one would imagine that you could also achieve resistance by just losing the B cell receptor, um, especially if you have acquired downstream mutations that would prevent any selective pressure to retain the receptor on the surface. And um, the reason why I bring this up is because indeed there is already evidence in the literature of one very specific tumor called Hodgkin disease where the lymphoma has lost the B cell receptor. This is something that has been discovered by the Rayeski lab again almost 30 years ago. And this is a case that is pointing out that tumors can overcome not only, you know, signaling pathways downstream, but they can overcome altogether the expression of a B cell receptor. And, you know, inspired by this work, uh, when I started my own lab, I decided really to invest time in understanding better uh, what a receptor does to an aggressive B cell lymphoma. So we decided to uh, tackle the problem from a genetic point of view namely to inactivate the B cell receptor altogether in a lymphoma and I ask ourselves what happens to these tumors. Um, and I will show you just a few data on that because these have been published in the meantime. But what I want to stress is again the human part. So you open a pathology book and you go to the chapter of Burkitt lymphoma and you will find the first sentence saying Burkitt lymphoma is consistently an IgM, namely B cell receptor expressing tumor. And this is basically whatever pathologists would tell you if you would speak to them. So um, when we started looking at that a bit more in detail from the mouse model, um, and I apologize if I now move the history and the, of the story in a, in a different way, uh, our mouse models were indicating us that Burkitt-like tumors could easily adapt to the loss of the B cell receptor. So we asked ourselves, is it really so that every patient that is diagnosed with Burkitt is always B cell receptor positive? And the answer was clearly no. From the very beginning, it was very clear, even screening only 30 patients, that actually a certain fraction of them, one third, had either completely lost the B cell receptor or actually had spots of cells or islands of the tumor where the receptor was missing. This is a case where we are standing here with IgM, which is the B cell receptor in this case. And you can see a case that is, you know, the conventional bona fide Burkitt with every single cell being stained with a brown color, which is the antibody against IgM. 
and we're standing here with PAX5 with a trans transcription fact that defines the B cells, and this is a typical case of a tumor where there is basically no trace anymore of B cell receptor expression. So this can happen, and why does this happen? Again, the genetics was easy to predict in this case. So immunoberkid lymphomas arise from germinal center B cells, and germinal center B cells undergo this process called somatic hypermutation, where, whereby you introduce mutation in the immunoglobulin genes. And these mutations are random. So sometimes you can introduce indeed a stop codon, which is something that in the normal germinal center would lead to the death of the cell. But if you had transformed cell, maybe you resist to that. So this is a case of a Burkitt lymphoma where we identified a clear crippling mutation, a stop codon being introduced in the clonal immunoglobulin light chain rearrangement that at least explained for this case the possible loss of the B cell receptor. So of course, if this tumor has lost the B cell receptor, it must have acquired before signalings or actually signals that would bypass the need of continuous B cell receptor expression. So this was not, so this was, you know, Burkitt and when, when I started then asking our friends pathologists to extend the work to other lymphomas and to understand whether this is just a feature of Burkitt or it's something that is much more obvious than before. And, 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 and these, were, these are information that, you know, when I started addressing the pathologists, they would not even listen to me. They were not even interested to test this because it was clearly so that everybody was sure that the B cell receptor was expressed in every mature B cell lymphoma. So, the more you look, the more you find. In diffuse large, which is the most common um, uh, B cell lymphomas in, in the Western world, we found now over 30% of diffuse large B cell lymphoma where there's really no trace of immunoglobulin expression. And when I mean immunoglobulin here again for Demeter, maybe for the specialist, we really mean tracing every single possible class of antibody produced by the cell. So it's not only IgM, as you know, you could produce IgG, IgD, IgA, so the pathologist would stain serial sections with the different antibodies and really try to make the point that these tumors eventually are negative. So the question is really how do tumors adapt to this loss? Because if we understand that, maybe we could also start thinking about therapies to, you know, kill these tumors. Um, and this is now what, what basically we started doing in the lab when I started my own lab, namely um, trying to have a mouse model that would allow us genetically to conditionally inactivate the B cell receptor in established tumor and ask what happens acutely soon after the deletion and eventually if the tumor would adapt chronically. And the experiment is done based on a mouse transgenic model where we have a MIC transgene that is expressing B cells. So this is recapitulating the MIC translocation that defines Burkitt lymphoma. And we combine them with a conditional allele for the immunoglobulin variable region of the heavy chain so that if you knock out this piece of DNA, the B cell would not be able to produce any more heavy chain and without a heavy chain, you don't produce an antibody and therefore you become B cell receptor negative. So very simple genetic combination. These mice develop tumors within three to four months and then you can expand these tumors. You can transplant them serially in immunocompetent animals, but you can also grow them in vitro. You can expose them to pre recombinase and then really start following day by day in vitro first and then in vivo, what happens to the B cell receptor negative cells. So this is just a flow cytometry of how a tumor looks before cre recombination. And the fact that we can generate so many cells at IgM negative is already telling you that the tumor adapted to the loss of the receptor and can expand in vitro. In fact, these are just growth curves in vitro of B cell receptor positive and their derivative. And you can see that after a little shock at the beginning, where probably there is some fine tuning that is being activated in the cell, the tumors without the B cell receptor grow happily as, happily as the B cell receptor positive do. So what was also striking was that, so this was indicating that tumors do indeed are able to adapt to physical loss of all the hubs that I showed you downstream of the B cell receptor. All the signaling pathways are being physically interrupted by the loss of the B cell receptor. But one other thing that we recognized was that these cells could grow alone, but if you would place them in competition with the B cell receptor positive, but actually they would disappear very rapidly. So there was a fitness problem provided by or resulting from the loss of the immunoglobulin, so that if you find yourself in a competitive microenvironment with cells that do and don't have the receptor, these cells at the beginning will likely actually get counter-selected. 
unless as any other tumor evolves and selects genetic mutations. In this case, the tumors were left alone growing in vitro for two to three weeks, so you don't put them under the same selective pressure. These cells will eventually evolve after some time in selecting secondary mutations. You can then place them back in competition, and now suddenly you recognize that some of these clones are completely resistant to the visa receptor positive one. So here we are having tumors that have actually restored their full capacity to even compete with their visa receptor positive counterparts. And this is commonly associated with activation of the NK-RAS gain of, uh, NK -RAS, so the NK-RAS gain of function mutations that in the meantime have been also identified now in a growing number of different chronic lymphocytic leukemia subsets, but also in Burkitt lymphoma. So this, this events that were actually pretty new at the time when we published the work are actually coming out from, from data coming from patients that are being treated also, for example, with beta receptor inhibitors. Okay, so we, we, this, is, this is all published, so I will just go very rapidly. So we discovered that the signaling pathway that is crucial um, in Burkitt-like tumors in this mouse model to sustain the fitness of the cell is a pathway that is not NF-kappa-B, is not ras map kinase, it's mainly a PA3 kinase pathway that has one major function, which is actually to inhibit one kinase called glycogen synthase kinase 3. And this kinase is absolutely crucial for the survival and the persistence of the cells, these PCR negative cells in vitro, um, because actually um, we measured that, so we, we could prove that this, this kinase is less phosphorylated in BCR negative cells, and when they acquire RAS mutations, this RAS map kinase pathway will overcome the PA3 kinase pathway, phosphorylate again GSK3, and this phosphorylation event is an inhibitory event that will actually sustain the activity of CIMIC, because one of the key targets of GSK3 is the proto-oncogene CIMIC itself. There's a phosphorylation event on um, trinity 62 that is actually introduced by GSK3, which actually stabilizes uh, MIC and, um, no, sorry, which actually promotes degradation of MIC by the ubiquitin uh, protosome pathway. So if you are in a situation where you deregulate de or reactivate or increase the activation of GSK3B, you will have actually an increased degradation of MIC and a downregulation of all the targets that are actually driven, driving the metabolic and anabolic phenotype that MIC does in, in this perfect cells. Okay, so if I bring it now into a clinical setting, because we like also to think about these experiments back in the patients, um, we envision a situation where we have constantly in a tumor evolving, a situation where maybe some tumors that are expressing MIC and have the PCR receptor may lose stochastically the PCR receptor during tumor progression. This could be somatic epi mutation, this could be genomic instability, and these cells in this competitive setting would be constantly counter-selected by the cells that are more fit, that are sitting in the same surrounding. This situation can, however, change dramatically if you start either treating these patients with drugs that will inhibit possibly the green cells because you will inhibit the PCR receptor signaling pathway, or if the tumor from the very beginning has acquired a mutation, let's assume RAS mutation, that would render the cell totally insensitive to the loss of the PCR receptor. So you have a situation here where in the age of PCR inhibitors, now we are not giving these inhibitors, I want to stress this, to Burkitt lymphoma, but MIC expressing cells are not found only in Burkitt lymphoma. And now we have underlined an important pathway that links the PCR receptor to MIC biology. So we believe that in this age, you can either unleash a clone that has lost the PCR receptor. Um, and the question is, at this point, how do we treat these patients? So how do we really get along with this, 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 this clonal events that can happen either naturally or can happen as a result of a treatment? So I will touch these three points now. Uh, and this is unpublished work that we have been working on. So I will first try to you know, understand better and tell you, share with you some information about what actually the loss of the receptor causes in vivo. All the experiments that I showed you so far were mainly tissue culture experiments. We take the tumors, we grow them in rich medium, we don't have the immune system around us, and all this you know, could have a dramatic impact on the biology of the tumor. So we were eager to understand whether what we learned in vitro is true also in vivo. And then of course, it was also very, uh, it is for us, one of our goals is to actually identify 
um, drugs that could kill the PISA receptor negative cells in order to provide first, for example, a second line treatment or even a first line treatment to prevent the evolution of PISA negative tumors. Another important thing that remains still a big question is, do the BISA receptor inhibitors that are being usually, that are being currently used in the clinics, can they really, um, are they really in effect, effective or not effective against BISA receptor negative tumors? Because if we eliminate the receptor, we might still have the kinases downstream that could mediate the function. So it's not clear whether the drugs that are being given nowadays to patients actually would work also on Ig negative tumors. Okay, so for the first point, if we inject tumors that are BCR positive or negative into an immunocompetent mouse, in both cases, the mouse will be killed within, you know, less than two months. Um, so negative cells grow in vitro, negative cells grow also in vivo. And this is basically when you isolate them, you inject them in isolation. If you inject them in competition, the experiment will usually indicate that unless they've acquired RAS mutations, these cells will disappear. So everything we learned in vitro is actually confirmed in vivo. But what basically we recognized already at the time when we published this work, that there was a lag in time between the growth of BCR positive and negative. The negative were growing a bit slower. So we thought this could be maybe related to the interaction between the tumor cells and the microenvironment that was somehow influenced by the presence or absence of the BCR receptor. And evidence that confirmed that the tumors we were looking in vitro were totally different from what we actually were looking in vivo came from a, a very simple experiment. So we performed a transcriptome analysis where the same cells will, were actually sorted out from an in vitro culture before the injection into animals. And actually we retrieved them also later from the lymphoid organs once they started expanding. And this is just a graphical view to show you how many genes are changing as a result of, you know, the growth of the tumor in vivo, no surprise, you know, you have to interact with the microenvironment, you select and you adapt to that environment. And the same is true also for BCR negative. So what we had learned in vitro in terms of signaling pathways, genes that we had also measured in that context could be, you know, different from the ones that we had in vivo. So we started really doing the experiment where we inject tumors in mice, we inject them as BCR positive or negative, uh, so these are serial transplantations. So we isolate the primary tumor, we delete the receptor in vitro, transplant the mice separately now because we want to have a clear view of what the receptor loss does on the tumor. And then looking really very early, early, intermediate and advanced stage. I mean, for us, advanced is 20 days. After that, we have to sacrifice the mice because these are very aggressive tumors. So the tumors home mostly to the bone marrow first which is also something that resembles Burkitt lymphoma. I mean, Burkitt grows in lymph nodes and in, the, in bones. Um, so this model preferentially likes to move first to the bone marrow, later to the spleen, and ultimately to the lymph node. And when we started counting tumor cells uh, over time, we basically recognized what we had already seen grossly by looking at Kaplan survival curve. So here we are just measuring the frequency of tumor cells in the bone marrow and the spleen at different time points with the black bar indicating the BCR positive and the gray bar indicating the BCR negative. For the BCR positive, we could not reach the final time point because the mice had to be sacrificed earlier for wealth reason. And, and, and you can appreciate that actually there's a very clear difference in the initial seeding and engraftment of the tumors when you lose the BCR receptor. And, that, and at some point in the growth in vivo, there will be something happening to the tumor that will allow these PISA receptor negative cells to take over and actually reach numbers that are reached in the PISA receptor positive setting around a week earlier. Now, if you think about the fact that these tumors divide every 12 hours, one week is a huge number of cell divisions at the very beginning. Um, but at this point, the cells are really extremely aggressive. And if you transplant them serially, you will finally realize that these cells will grow as rapidly as this ones. So this, of course, over time is selection for events that will allow a tumor to adapt to the lack of the BCA receptor. Among the different things that we scored, this is now done with a pathologist who was able to really try to quantify the levels of MYC in the tissue in situ. Um, um, we could, you know, similar to what we had seen before um, in, in the in vitro system, although the difference is not very clear, it's not very dramatic, but there's a very significant reduction of MIC. Uh, there is a significant reduction of MIC 
protein levels in the B cell receptor negative cells identified in situ, and the same is compatible with you know a, a slight reduction in the cell size. You may know that MIC controls the cell size, so these two elements are going face to face. Um, and, um, and, and this is how the tumors look like. So this is an histopathological analysis of the bone marrow in the spleen, uh, looking at different time points after the transplantation. So at an early time point, you can appreciate already a very marked you know, um, overtaking of the bone marrow microenvironment by B cell receptor positive tumors. The negative first will grow in islets, and you can see it even more clear here, and then will finally explode much later in development. In the spleen, you have this very strong and massive infiltration in the perifollicular area, so they don't invade the, 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 the white pulp from, from, the, from the beginning, from the entrance, so they are not competing initially with the B cells, they're actually ob obliging the follicles to contract by the expansion from, from the periphery. So they get in from the bloodstream and then actually tend to invade the follicles from, from the outer periphery. Um, so this is to show you that there is indeed a very marked difference at the beginning. So the tumors without the receptor have some problems in getting along with growing in an immunocompetent host. Another striking thing that happens very often, not always, is that in order to restore their fitness, the B cell receptor negative do something very unique. They turn on again the VDJ recombination machinery which is the enzymes that do undergo VDJ recombination to reassemble a second immunoglobulin gene. And they use the second chromosome because the first chromosome has been deleted by Cree. So they use the second chromosome to rearrange a new variable region. So they generate a new piece of receptor. And that receptor, you know, takes over, over time, the, the spleen and the lymph nodes. Here is still a situation where the piece of receptor negative cells are winning. So these are just cells that were generated from these cells here in vivo as a result of secondary VDJ recombination. And we could prove that because we could prove that these cells have deleted um, the, the original conditional allele and have rearranged a new immunoglobulin rearrangement. We sequence it. So these are clonal events that are highly selected in the tumors, proving once more that the receptor provides an important fitness advantage to the tumors. And this is not, again, only a little game that we observe in the mouse model. Um, we have learned also that nowadays, every time we observe something in the mouse, before actually consolidating it or actually investing even more time on it, we immediately go to humans. If we don't see it in the human setting, we let it go. I mean, because many of these animal models are, you know, effects that are related to the models. So what we did was we asked the pathologists again, do we see indeed in some tumors, the reactivation of the enzyme that rearranged the immunoglobulin genes. And this is a case of where the tumor had lost the immunoglobulins, all sorts of isotypes were tested. This is an in situ RNA analysis done again by Claudio Tripaldo in Palermo. I want to stress the fact that without the tight collaboration with Claudio and other pathologists, all this would have never been possible. And so we are basically discovering that also human aggressive mature B cell lymphomas in some instances, try possibly to reactivate the recombination machinery, which is not only done by RAG1 and by 2 but also by terminal deoxytransferase, which is another important enzyme that together with the RAG proteins is important in the assembling of the VDJ of the immunoglobulin heavy and light chain. So this is something happening also in human tumors. Whether this will now lead to the reactivation of a new receptor is a big question that we are trying to address. But tumors are plastic enough that if these events are possibly associated with a better fitness. Possibly, in some cases, they will turn on a second receptor that probably will help them survive and grow better. So is this initial problem in the initial growth of tumor related to the immune system, or is it a cell intrinsic problem? And we address this question by, again, doing a very simple comparison where we inject tumors in immunocompetent syngenic mice or in, in immunocompromised mice that lack the, uh, the adaptive immune system. So these NSG mice lack T cells, B cells, and NK cells. And it was very clear from the beginning that if you inject tumor cells, and these are BCR negative cells, but also BCR positive are growing better. So this is indicating that even the positive are turning on some sort of immune response against them. You have a very significant increase in the number of tumor cells. So the immune system somehow is able to contain, for some reason, 
preferentially the growth of these receptor negative tumors. Um, we went and pushed the system to the level where we started injecting very, very few cells. So with the idea pointing out that if we go below a certain threshold, the immune system will be able to take over and actually cure the mouse. So what we started doing is injecting very few cells in the order of hundreds to 500 cells. And you can appreciate in this preliminary experiment that actually if you inject PCR negative tumors below, these are, I think, uh, something like 100 cells. You basically have mice that will never fall down with the disease, whereas you get basically mice or a certain amount of mice dying um, of tumors where you inject PCR receptor positive tumors. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole thing will not work if you inject them in uh, not skid gamma chains or in immunodeficient mice, pointing out that actually the BSA receptor positive cells can overcome the immune system, even if they're injected at very low numbers. You can see a certain number of mice dying, but this doesn't happen with the negatives, indicating that probably they're even more immuno, uh, immunogenic or they are in situations that facilitate their, you know, clearance by the immune system. So to understand which cells could possibly be involved in that, we started doing a number of different things. We, of course, did a lot of immunophenotyping of the bone marrow, of the spleen, to try to understand which populations were increasing. This is a single cell RNA sequencing experiment where we omitted the tumor cells. We just concentrated on the microenvironmental cells so that we basically didn't waste money on sequencing a lot of tumor cells. And this is just a UMAP representation of the different populations that we found in either control mice, which are mice that were injected with PBS, or mice injected with PCR positive and PCR negative tumors. Um, you can appreciate that there was a, a, a frag, there was a cluster that included T cells and K cells and NKT cells that was increasing in the PCR positive and even more in the PCR negative. And our attention went immediately to these cells because, of course, they were the likely cells that could potentially recognize um, the, the the tumor cells. Um, so we started looking at T cells and we identified the higher frequency of CD8 positive T cells in BCR negative um, 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 transplanted animals. And this is at early and at later time point. You can also appreciate the, the localization of the T cells. So here we are actually coloring with magenta CD8 cytotoxic T cells. The, the brown is, is mixed staining, identifying the tumor cells. So you can really see these rosettes of you know, T cells hanging around this island of MYC expressing tumors uh, in an early stage of the, of, of the growth, which is actually barely visible in a BCR positive um, setting. Um, these tumors are not only recruiting T cells, these T cells are likely proliferating. And this is again a beautiful work that Claudio Tripodo did in Palermo, where he stained for T67 to map proliferating cells and combine them with the CD8 markers to really in situ point to the um, proliferation of areas which are actually infiltrated by a lot of proliferating tumor cells. Um, and, um, and, and if you take the tumor cell, the T cells from this, this bone marrow and you do in vitro experiments to test the interferon gamma production, again, you could prove that these cells are producing interferon gamma, pointing out to the potential activation state of these cells. So we are in a situation where the inhibition of the B cell receptor in this very aggressive lymphoma in the early stages of, a, of, of, of tumor colonization leads to the local recruitment of T cells, activation in situ of these T cells, and production of interferon gamma. So the natural experiment was what happens if you deplete the T cells? Are these tumors just going back to normal size? Um, so we go for experiments where you just in, inject in animals anti-CD8 depleting T cells, uh, antibodies, and you can see a very substantial increase in the number of tumor cells, but never, never, ever reaching the levels that actually we got when we inject tumor cells. So clearly, T cells are contributing to the immune response, but probably they are not the likely most um, effective immune candidate that is actually containing the, the disease. So we then started looking a bit more carefully at other cell types. Remember that in that cluster, they were also in K cells, in K cells, recognize tumor cells on the basis of a down regulation of MHC class one levels. So they also need an activating signal by the tumor cells. And indeed we recognize that our tumors that have lost the PISA receptor, and these are actually these two overlay here, are down regulating class one pretty substantially. I don't show you the normal B cells that would actually be around 10 to the five. 
So also the B-cell receptor positive tumors don't regulate class one, but to a lower extent, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's a very massive down regulation of class one. So um, then the, the, the natural experiment was what happens if you now start depleting NK cells? At this point, the prediction was that the response would be much more significant given the fact that um, the class one down regulation was pretty substantial. So we deplete NK cells with antibodies. And here again, you finally see a very dramatic effect. You see basically that the tumor size, the spleen size, the lymph node size, the bone marrow is, is massively infiltrated with these receptor negative tumor cells. Um, and this happens also in the BCR positive again. I don't want to, I want to stress the fact that NK and CD8 positive T cells are also rejecting or trying to reject BCR positive, but the efficacy of rejecting negative is far higher. And this is just a fold increase in tumor cells in the different organs that we actually uh, scored when we compare them um, to the cells that actually just inje were injected with the isotype control. So there's a very strong uh, immune response raised by, by NK cells. So this is the first part of the story. So this has already some implication for the clinics. Of course, this means already that, you know, an arm that should be developed more. And now you may have heard about, you know, cellular therapies, CAR T cell therapies, but there's also CAR and K cell therapies that are actually being used. I think modulation of NK cells which has been totally neglected in the analysis of you know, at least aggressive B-cell malignancies could be considered one possibility, especially if they turn out to be losing the B-cell receptor. Um, but how do we treat now negative lymphomas? And here I will take five more minutes. It's going to be very fast. So the first question was, do the drugs that we give to patients now work in these tumors? And I'm referring now to this mouse model. So take it with all the limitation of the model. So we started treating different tumors with the three major um, uh, drugs that are being given, actually two major drugs that are being given to um, leukemia and lymphoma patients, namely BTK inhibitor and PI3 kinase delta inhibitor. And this is, you know, um, an in vitro experiment where we measure the IC50 and, and, and we measure viability of the cells over a range of concentration. Um, and the good news is that the blue bar uh, the, the orange bar, which is actually the B cell receptor negative cells, do still respond to ibrutinib. Actually, they paradoxically respond even a bit better, possibly because they rewire their B cell receptor signaling pathway to a level that they become even more dependent on BTK. So this is a good news for the patients. But the bad news is that this is something happening acutely. So we are testing cells soon after the inhibition of the B cell receptor. Or we analyze cells that have chronically adapted to that. For example, the tumors that have acquired RAS, MAP kinase mutation, and other mutation. And these tumors become totally resistant to BTK inhibitors. And this happens also with PI3 kinase inhibitors. And here, with, in collaboration with Verastem, who provided us with the drug, we actually tested also the hypothesis a double inhibitor of delta and gamma, which is now in clinical trial, could actually do a better work than PI3 kinase delta alone, but the result is actually very similar. So, uh, the message here is that tumors that have adopted and likely are the ones that you select or you identify when the patient gets to the clinics because, you know, tumors that lose acutely the B-cell receptor are very difficult to catch in the clinical setting. You will get likely here to the clinical setting maybe after resistance, maybe after, you know, a tumor has grown to a certain degree where probably evolution of genetic lesions have made the tumor already independent of the receptor if the tumor has lost the receptor. At that point, these drugs are useless. Um, so we decided now to, to ju just hunt for synthetic lethality. So our idea was maybe these tumors get adapted to other signaling pathways and we want to kill those ones. And maybe these are the ones that we really should think of um, in treating, at least in second lines, B cell receptor negative, aggressive lymphomas. I'm not making any story here on chronic lymphocytic leukemia because, of course, this is a very different entity. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a it's, it has a completely different also dynamic and kinetics and growth and resistance, um, but it might be helpful to actually eventually test whether some of the drugs that we are identifying uh, could be effective also in BTK resistant CLL. So we set up with, in collaboration with the EFOM experimental therapeutic group, a very simple screen. We, I wanted to go directly in the clinic, so I didn't, I didn't want to go with identification of new compound. We wanted to go 
um, to offer the, the patients possibly a new drug. So I went with a repur repurposing screen. So we screened over 2,300 FDA approved drugs. There were some investigational drugs as well. And uh, we screened these tumors for three lines, three independent tumors, divided as PCR positive, negative. Um, and we identified a number of hits. Uh, some of them actually totally unpredicted. Some were more predicted. So for example, this one here is an mTOR inhibitor, which we had already shown in our nature paper that, uh, that was more affecting or negative. So these PCR negative tumors become more sensitive to inhibition of the mTOR pathway. Um, but this is, for example, an interesting drug that is able to kill not only PCR positive and negative, like, you know, the ones that I showed you before, like ibrutinib did, but it's also very effective in killing these very aggressive PCR negative tumors that are resisting um, to RAS, to, to ibrutinib and to pietri kinase. So we have identified a number of these drugs that we are now, you know, validating in vivo for the efficacy to kill um, tumors um, in the immunocom in, in immunocompetent setting. Um, but this is possibly an interesting uh, set of molecules that should be looked more carefully in different animal models uh, to see whether some of them could indeed become um, interesting repurposing uh, drugs. So the power is that they're already approved, so they should be just proposed now in, in a clinical trial and tested in a, in a very specific manner. Okay, with this, um, I want to leave you with one slide, again, because I hope Demeter will appreciate that. Um, because when, when you design a drug to kill a tumor, of course, the first thing to do is to make sure that the target is there, right? Now, I, for, for solid cancer, I don't know. But the very disappointing thing in, in, in blood cancer is that, you know, you have a BCI inhibitor given to patients. But how many pathologists screen at diagnosis for the expression of a PCI receptor? I mean, surprisingly, nobody does that. So you start giving drugs to patients without even predicting whether this drug would possibly have or not an effect. And I think this is unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And it's probably more related to some of our tumors, the blood tumors, because, you know, I guess if you have to give an ALK inhibitor, you will have to show that you have an ALK amplification of some sort. I mean, this is what is routinely done. And the reason why I bring this up again, and I want to make a point here, is because there's been just now a paper in New England Journal of Medicine, so it's not, you know, a trivial paper, where they uh, developed a new way to deliver to lymphoma a specific microtubule inhibitor, okay? So this is a typical drug that has an antibody, and a, and, a, and a drug that will basically be delivered to the tumor. So they decided that the antibody to be used to target the tumor was an antibody against CD79B, which is the BISA receptor. So you have to assume that the patient has a BISA receptor on the tumor. Now, there is one comment here that the editor made. So this, this drug, this combination did not perform much, much better than the conventional r -shop chemotherapy. I mean, still it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but there was one comment that was very interesting. So they, they, the, the, the editor writes that this drug was not very effective, especially in germinal center B-cell-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So now I don't want to end up, I don't want to show you um, more data, but germinal center tumors have one feature. They very commonly downregulate the B-cell receptor physiologically. So, you know, if I had to think about which tumors would have not worked in this trial, these were exactly these tumors. So we have contacted now the authors trying to get the histology of these patients just to prove that the reason why this, this group did not respond as effectively is just because the target is not there. <clears throat> it's not because the drug doesn't work, it's just the receptor is not expressed to some extent. Okay, so take home message, four of them, that would be, five of them would be the important ones. So the first one is that, you know, um, mid-driven lymphomas are able to adapt to the loss of the B-cell receptor, and very likely any type of B-cell malignancy will do so. So I think this is now a rule. This, we have to accept that, and we have to act in, in order to interfere with the resistances. And, you know, the, the, the history of PDK inhibitors is already ongoing, but there will be more to go. 
And there are more cases that will be out, um, described as being completely lacking a beta receptor. Okay, so then we have a second important point here, namely that the extinction of the beta receptor is indeed um, something that triggers the immune system in some way. So we don't know exactly how, whether the tumors, for example, have higher genomic instability, produce more neoepitopes, and become more immunogenic. So this would be an interesting hypothesis to test. Um, this response can be potentially also clinically exploited. Um, the tumors are actually recruiting locally CD8 T cells, and most importantly, as a result of the down regulation of class 1 and class 2, they have a very strong ability to attract natural killer cells that are able to clear the tumors. And finally, you know, we believe that you know, it's time now to really identify a second line of drugs that will basically be needed to treat these thousands of patients that every day are receiving BCI inhibitors and for which we still don't understand well what to do with, with, with these complications. And with this, I, I'd like to leave you with the, the most important slide. So this is really work of probably 15 years in my lab. So I, I, I went very rapidly to a lot, to many experiments that were done by members that are now in the meantime already gone somewhere else and continuing their career as medical doctors. So Hiroshi Arima and Paula Sinder, but this is an important point that I also want to stress, the, the importance of having medical doctors in the lab. Uh, they've made really a big difference because mixing up different uh, expertise and different way of looking at the biological problem motivates also the ones that look at the problem more from a clinical point or a biological point in a, in a very uh, constructed manner. So having doctors is something that has really changed my, my lab. Um, and all this would have not been possible um, without the help of these crazy pathologists who were following these crazy ideas that we were generating in the mouse model. Uh, so I, I really like to acknowledge Fabio Facchetti, Maurillo Ponzoni, Claudio Ribaudo, and Marco Pizzi, who are continuing to you know, nurture us with new cases, with new uh, validation of our data. Um, and, and, and of course, the experimental therapeutic program for the last part, which helped us you know, starting to have some ideas of which drug could help patients which have this type of resistance. So with that, uh, I leave you, um, and I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take questions.